Drinking too much alcohol is often said to be harmful, but Scott Palmer swears that the third beer he had that night might have been his saving grace. With his wife Gloria away on a business trip, Scott found himself with an unusual amount of free time. Normally, when Gloria was home, he'd never indulge like this. But that night, he settled in with some TV and a few beers. It was that third beer that did it. It must have filled his bladder to bursting because, unlike most nights when he slept soundly, he woke up needing to use the bathroom. He glanced at the clock on his nightstand. Free M, one of the neighbor's dogs, was barking incessantly. It was probably the richest dog, he thought, the one they kept in their outside kennel. Scott always wondered why they even bothered having a pet if they were just going to lock it up all the time. Maybe it was just one of the many issues between Sam and Natalie Rich. As Scott sat on the edge of the bed, stretching his bad knee, he suddenly heard a sound that made his blood run cold. It was faint, but unmistakable, the slow creak of the back door being opened. A shiver ran down his spine, a mix of fear and adrenaline flooding his system. Instinct kicked in. Moving swiftly but silently, he headed to the closet where his old Winchester was hidden over the door. His father, a cop in the 80s, had drilled into him the lessons learned at the police academy. One crucial piece of advice. Rack around in the chamber when entering a building late at night. The sound alone was meant to send potential intruders running. Scott's dad may have had old-fashioned methods, but given the current situation, his advice felt like a lifeline. Scott couldn't recall ever being this terrified. He took a deep breath to steady his nerves, then went to the bedroom door. With shaky hands, he loaded the first of the three double buck shells into the chamber and shouted down the stairs, masking his fear of the veneer of bravado. Hey, come on up. Got a little surprise for you. The next sound Scott heard was the screen door slamming. His heart raced as he hurried to the back bedroom and peered out the window. Under the clear night sky, illuminated by the moonlight, he saw someone clambering over the backyard fence. Though he couldn't make out the features, it was unmistakably a man. As the figure fumbled over the fence, something metallic glinted in the moonlight and fell to the ground. Was it a magnum? It certainly looked like it. The man quickly retrieved it and stuffed it back in his pocket before making his escape. Now, the neighbor's dog was barking frantically, and the rich's back porch light flicked on, casting a weak glow that failed to fully reveal the fleeing intruder. Scott's heart pounded as he rushed back to his bedroom and grabbed the phone. What's your emergency? The dispatcher asked. Somebody just broke into my house, but they've left and are running away, Scott replied, his voice taut with urgency. Are you safe? The dispatcher asked. Yeah, I think so, but the person's getting away. Maybe you can catch them. The conversation quickly turned tense, with Scott desperately urging the police to hurry. The dispatcher, however, explained that response time might be delayed due to other emergencies. Frustration boiled over in Scott. What? Do those emergencies include shopping for donuts and coffee before you get to my house two miles away? He snapped. Meanwhile, two miles away, Walter Marshall sat in his car, trying to catch his breath. Panic surged through him. How did everything go so wrong? He had spent the entire week meticulously preparing for last night, scouting the area, choosing a discreet parking spot, and planning the best route to and from the Palmer house. He even endured the relentless barking of the neighbor's dog, walking through the alley at 2am for three nights straight to normalize the noise. But now, the lack of sleep was clouding his mind and affecting his work performance. Damn it, planning and executing the perfect plan wasn't easy. This was Walter's best shot at getting rid of Scott Palmer. As Walter sat in his car, he couldn't help but wonder how disappointed Gloria would be when she returned from her business trip and found out she was still married to that jerk. Of course, Gloria would never show her disappointment. She was too good at putting on a facade. For the past six months, ever since he joined Gloria's department, Walter had sensed her indifference towards him. Yet he saw the signs, the way she smiled when she walked by his desk. Walter was convinced that part of that smile was meant just for him. And now, all the meticulous work they had put into last night's plan 
had gone down the drain. Walter knew there were other ways to deal with Scott, but they would take too long and he was tired of waiting to be with Gloria. He rubbed his face, recalling the first time he saw her. It was in a meeting and Gloria had sat right next to him. Her skirt had hiked up a bit as she sat down, revealing a glimpse of her thigh before she pulled it back down. She had smiled directly at him, extended her hand and said, Hi, I'm Gloria Palmer, just like that. Then last month, he spotted her in the break room having lunch with Dorothy McCorklin. He asked if he could join them and Gloria, with her sweet voice and radiant smile, welcomed him. As Gloria chatted with Dorothy, Walter felt her words were meant for him. Gloria laughed, saying, Sometimes, Dorothy, I envy your single life. I've been trying to train Scott for twenty years, and this morning, I almost fell into the toilet because he left the seat up again. My fault for not turning on the light. Dorothy shared her own dating mishaps, and they both laughed, but Walter understood Doria's subtle message. She wanted to be rid of Scott. Walter vividly remembered the morning she left her house key on her desk. It seemed like an unspoken invitation for him to duplicate it. She was waiting for his report on the Gray's audit, and when he dropped it off at her cubicle, there were her keys just sitting there. He took them, made an excuse to the receptionist, and hurried to the hardware store to make a copy. It wasn't hard to spot the house key on her keychain. The whole process took less than half an hour, but by the time he returned to the office, Gloria was back from her meeting. Panic set in. He couldn't just leave the keys on her desk. It would look too suspicious. After a frantic brainstorm, he decided to toss the keys under Gloria's Honda near the driver's side door in the parking garage. Problem solved. Back in the present, as he continued to fantasize, his arousal began to fade. Just before he could reach a climax, headlights reflecting off his rearview mirror startled him. He slouched down as a police cruiser passed by. It took another 13 minutes for his heart rate to settle before he drove home to his apartment. Sitting in his car, Walter felt a surge of frustration and despair. He had poured so much time and energy into this plan, and now everything was unraveling. His longing for Gloria, his obsession with her, was slipping further out of reach. The perfect opportunity had vanished, leaving him in a cold, bitter reality. Two officers arrived at the Palmer home an hour after the frantic 911 call to investigate and file a report. Officers Potter and Harper were polite but distant, showing little sympathy for Scott's distress. As they inspected the property with flashlights, they noted that the back door hadn't been tampered with. Scott was certain he had checked all the doors before bed, but the police seemed skeptical, their doubt evident in their expressions. After completing their report, they left through the front door. Scott overheard Officer Potter joking about grabbing a donut and coffee, prompting laughter from Officer Harper. Their careless banter likely woke any neighbors who were still sleeping. Too wired to sleep, Scott brewed a pot of coffee and spent the next three hours sorting paperwork, his mind racing. At 7.10 a.m., he called his wife to say good morning, but decided not to worry her about the break-in until she returned home that evening. Her flight was due at 6.25, and she had driven herself to the airport. By 8.10 a.m., he informed his boss that he wouldn't be coming into work and explained why. Next, he called a locksmith to change the locks and install a couple of door alarms. The locksmith finished before 1.15 p.m., leaving Scott with nothing else to do but head to the office for the rest of the day. Randolph Shelton, Scott's boss, had already informed the office about the break-in, so Scott spent the first hour fielding questions from concerned co-workers. Their genuine concern was a small comfort, but it also made him relive the fear over and over. Eventually, things settled down, allowing him to focus and get some work done. Gloria stood at the door, her frustration mounting as her key failed to unlock it. This day was spiraling downhill fast, all thanks to Walter Marshall's incompetence. His shoddy audit report had rendered her trip to Portland a complete waste. She planned to report his errors to the department manager on Friday. She was stuck in Portland because Marshall hadn't double-checked his figures before she left. 
Fortunately, Donald Braves had all the documentation to prove the Portland officer's compliance with financial policies. Relieved that Donald hadn't reacted poorly to her surprise visit, Gloria was grateful to catch an earlier shuttle home. She prided herself on being a problem solver, but now, standing at her own door, she felt helpless. Trying the back door yielded the same result. Her key was useless. Panic set in. Just weeks ago, she and Scott had watched Asterisk Unfaithful Asterisk, where a similar situation led to drastic consequences. Scott had joked about changing the locks if she ever cheated, and now, faced with this scenario, she couldn't help but think of his jest, despite having done nothing wrong. She hurriedly called Scott, her voice barely steady. Scott, what's going on? My key won't work in the locks at home. Scott, caught off guard, blurted out the first thing that came to mind, which wasn't the smartest move given the situation. Gloria, I thought your flight was at 6.25. What does that have to do with me not being able to get in the house? Why are the locks changed? I'll be home in 25 minutes. I'm really sorry. I'll explain everything when I get there. Just hold on, love. Hurry up. I really need to pee and my bladder is not happy. Gloria replied, frustration and urgency in her voice. Scott kept apologizing as he grabbed his keys and rushed out the door. Merit a few traffic laws, he made it home in the promised 25 minutes. He opened the front door just as Gloria got out of her car. Despite her angry look, she still kissed him before hurrying inside. Scott retrieved her suitcase and briefcase from the car. Inside, he had one of Gloria's favorite ales poured and ready for her. Seeing her husband with a sheepish smile and the peace offering, Gloria couldn't help but smile back. She hugged him and gave him a kiss. Now spill it. What's going on with the locks? Scott recounted the night's events, detailing everything that had occurred. Gloria was stunned by how close she had come to losing her beloved. Tears streamed down Gloria's face at the mere thought of life without Scott. She felt a surge of remorse for her earlier anger on the phone and apologized to him, her voice trembling with emotion. I'm so sorry for snapping at you, she whispered. We're definitely getting a security system. Christina is coming home from school next weekend, and I won't risk her safety. On Friday morning, Gloria parked in the underground garage, meticulously following her new routine. Before stepping out, she secured her key ring in the side pocket of her purse, determined never to repeat the fiasco of losing her keys last month. It had taken her over an hour to find them, with Dorothy's help retracing her steps. Gloria had thought she left them on her desk, but in her rush to the morning meeting, she had misplaced them. She even searched under her desk and in the trash can before Dorothy found them under the car. Using the button on the door to lock her car, a safety measure Scott had taught her after reading about thieves intercepting key fob signals in parking lots, Gloria felt a shiver of paranoia. An internet article had mentioned a similar incident where a woman was attacked in her car. The theory was that the attacker hid in the back seat and surprised her. Gloria used to think these precautions were excessive, but after the attempted break-in, she saw the value in being cautious. As Gloria walked past Walter Marshall's cubicle, she felt his eyes on her, sending a chill down her spine. There was something about him that always unsettled her. Walter had joined the department about six months ago, and during a staff meeting, he was already seated, staring at her as she entered the room. With no other option, she had taken the only available seat next to him. She remembered the unsettling moment when he tried to peek up her skirt, forcing her to quickly adjust it. His gaze had then shifted to her chest. Instead of calling him out, she had introduced herself with a firm handshake and a smirk, masking her discomfort. A few weeks ago, Walter had rudely interrupted a conversation Gloria was having with Dorothy in the break room. Despite feeling uncomfortable, they hadn't had the heart to tell him to leave. The situation had grown increasingly tense and uncomfortable. When Walter had attempted to join the conversation, Gloria and her co-workers had exchanged nervous glances, clearly unsettled by his presence and behavior. Feeling fed up with Walter's unprofessional conduct, Gloria made the difficult decision to schedule a meeting with her manager, Joshua Morrison. That afternoon, she planned to address Walter's incompetence 
and the growing concerns of potential harassment. Gloria hoped this confrontation would lead to Walter being reassigned or even terminated from the company. The thought of continuing to work alongside him filled her with a deep sense of dread and unease. Later that evening, Walter sat alone in front of his large screen TV, obsessively watching her make videos he had surreptitiously recorded of Gloria. The advancements in technology had made it disturbingly easy for him to invade her privacy and satisfy his twisted desires. Walter's history of sexual misconduct was long and troubling. In high school, he had been caught by a teacher attempting to film up a cheerleader's skirt, an incident that had resulted in a three-day suspension. But that had only fueled Walter's deviant behavior, leading him to create a website filled with illicitly obtained footage and photographs. When the authorities had discovered the extent of Walter's crimes, he was arrested at the tender age of 15. Though his parents had hired a savvy attorney who had managed to keep him off the offender registry, Walter had still faced a three-year suspended sentence. And even now, as an adult, the shadow of his past actions continued to loom over him. Most of the images were taken at the office, Gloria in the conference room, at her cubicle, even standing in line across the street at the Starbucks. But Walter's favorite was a 33-second clip of Gloria running down the park path in her jogging outfit. If only he had a way to blur out her husband from the video, Walter decided to spend Saturday searching for an editing program to remove Scott Palmer's image from the footage. Of course, the program would be unnecessary once Scott Palmer was out of the picture for good. Then Walter could take all the videos he wanted of Gloria when they were together. His frustration in the next part of the video almost spoiled his enjoyment. Lost in thought, he had forgotten to move the drone away from the Palmer yard. Suddenly, Scott Palmer had emerged from the house with a magnum. Aiming at the drone, Walter reacted quickly, maneuvering the controls just in time to avoid being shot. He was tempted to report Scott for violating FAA rules, which prohibit shooting at a drone, even if it's taking pictures of your property. But Walter hesitated, unsure if reporting Scott would lead back to him. After the video ended, Walter cleaned up and reflected on the afternoon. What an incredible woman Gloria was. Walter realized too late how poorly his Graves audit report had turned out. His mind had been elsewhere most of the time he reviewed the Portland office books. It was clear that Mr. Morrison let Walter off with just a warning because of Gloria's efforts to protect him. She must have flown to Portland herself to smooth things over with Graves and prevent Walter from getting into trouble with their manager. Come Monday morning, he vowed to focus on his work to avoid more trouble. Losing his job would mean losing precious time with Gloria. But before Monday, he would plan his next move in dealing with Scott Palmer. On Saturday morning, Gloria and Scott were gearing up for a run. Gloria needed to blow off some steam. She was fuming at her weak boss. Scott listened attentively as Gloria vented her frustration. I can't believe Joshua just gave that jerk a warning, she said, her voice trembling with anger and hurt. My whole week was wasted because of Marshall's screw-ups, Doria fumed, her voice trembling with anger. And when I told Joshua about the harassment, he just told me to take it up with HR. He knows when to stay quiet. Scott listened, feeling a rush of protectiveness and frustration. He understood the challenges women face in the workplace, especially someone as striking as Gloria. He felt incredibly lucky to be married to her. Gloria was not only stunning, but also faithful and resilient. She had bounced back to her pre-pregnancy shape six months after Christina's birth, and within a year, you couldn't even tell she had a baby. Scott's mind wandered back to their vacation in the Bahamas, their first trip alone since Christina was born. Leaving Christina with his parents, they flew to Miami and then sailed to Nassau. Six days of bliss in paradise, Gloria stunned Scott by revealing her new belly button piercing. That trip marked the first time he saw her sunbathe topless, a sight you would never forget. As Scott finished stretching, they were ready to run. Gloria, trying to shake off the stress, began to relax. They headed towards the park, about a half a mile away, where a scenic trail led to the waterfront. At the park's north end, there was a hill with a staircase carved into it minus 300 and 17 steps to the top. On good days, 
They could run the whole way without stopping. But today, the weight of the week had drained their energy, so on their way back, they decided to walk a last mile. Scott's eyes drifted to a figure on a bench, seemingly engrossed in his phone, but the angle seemed odd. It reminded him of past encounters with creeps filming topless women at beaches. As they passed, Scott couldn't shake the feeling. Gloria, he began hesitantly, that guy on the bench. It looks weird, like those times we've seen creeps filming. Gloria, lost in conversation about Christina's upcoming visit, barely registered his words. But when she finally turned back to look, her eyes widened in shock. Oh my God, that's Walter Marshall. The realization hit her like a ton of bricks, and the air around them seemed to grow colder. The sense of violation and danger was unmistakable, and Gloria's heart pounded in her chest. What was that guy doing? Why was he filming us? I knew there was something off about him, Scott said, his voice laced with anger and concern. Should I go back and confront him? To what? He's in a public park, and we can't prove he's filming us unless we grab his phone. I'll add this to my report to HR on Monday. Gloria felt a knot tighten in her stomach. Scott, I want you to be more careful and stay alert. I don't trust this guy. Start carrying that mace spray. Gloria hesitated, feeling a wave of discomfort, but she knew Scott was right. The unease gnawed at her even more now. Scott didn't mention it to Gloria, but he recognized the man on the park bench from a previous encounter. He knew the police couldn't do much about someone simply using a phone in a park, but Scott had other options. Once they were home, Scott wasted no time. He immediately contacted the investigation firm his brokerage used and asked the owner to return his call urgently, or at the latest by Monday morning. Meanwhile, Alexa spoke with Paul West from HR on Monday about her concerns, including the incident with Walter Marshall filming in the park on Saturday. Paul informed her that they couldn't act directly on this, but would warn Walter on Tuesday about giving unwanted attention to female staff, which might be considered harassment. Are you going to tell them I complained? Gloria asked, her voice trembling with anxiety. No, Gloria, I'll keep it confidential. That's allowed for a warning. If the situation worsens, we might have to disclose the signed complaint. If he hires a lawyer, they'll definitely want to see it. Hopefully, a warning will be enough to change his behavior. I'll make sure to follow up. Gloria left the meeting with a flicker of hope that Walter's behavior would change, that the warning would be enough to prevent any further issues. Her mother's voice echoed in her mind, always encouraging her to find the good in people. Her mother believed there must always be a reason behind someone's misdeeds, unable to accept that some people might simply have malicious intent. But as the day wore on, Gloria's optimism was tested, the shadows of doubt and fear creeping back in, casting a dark cloud over her resolve. Gloria had always strived to live by her mother's wisdom. In high school, she was not just the cheer squad captain and homecoming queen, but also a living testament to Patricia's values and grace. She'd worked hard to embody that strength and compassion, but people like Walter Marshall pushed her patience and principles to their limits. From the moment he joined the department six months ago, Gloria had felt a chill whenever their paths crossed. There was something about him that unsettled her, something that gnawed at her peace of mind. At 11.15 a.m., Mark Morris, the owner of Morris Investigations, met with Scott, his urgency evident from the get-go. Scott's message over the weekend had spurred Mark into action, and he was quick to recognize the gravity of the situation. Mark, I need you to dig up everything on this Marshall guy. Where's he from? What's his background? Is he a threat? Scott demanded, his voice tense with urgency. Gloria mentioned he joined a department six months ago and keeps his personal life under wraps. She avoids him, but others have tried to engage him without success. Mark jotted down notes, his brow furrowed as Scott briefed him. Looking up, he said, I'll contact our attorney right away and have them reach out to Gloria's HR department. Given her formal complaint and Saturday's incident, they'll need to provide all the information on Marshall. Our attorney won't take no for an answer. Otherwise, we'll consider legal action. We'll dig deeper into Marshall's background. I'm not sure how thoroughly the company vetted him, 
Mark added with determination. Thanks, Mark. You understand how crucial this is for me. With a break-in at our house and now this, I'm on edge and need answers. Please, consider it done. We'll start working on it today. I've got some time this week, and I'll assign Aaron Matthews, one of our top investigators, to handle this. We'll get you the information you need. What about involving the police? Scott asked, his voice tinged with worry. We'll loop them in if and when we have something concrete. Right now, all we've got is a co-worker acting oddly and being spotted in a public park a couple of times. Mark replied, his tone practical yet reassuring. If we contact Marshall now before we've got, he might go into hiding and become more cautious. Scott's eyes narrowed as he mulled over the details. You know, it just occurred to me a few weeks back. A drone flew over our property and hovered over Gloria while she was sunbathing. Any chance Marshall owns a drone? I'll check into it. Some of the larger drones are registered with the FAA. We'll look into that, Mark said, his resolve hardening. If you think of anything else, any small details that didn't seem significant before, give me a call on my cell. Every bit of information helps if we end up involving the police. Also, would you feel more comfortable if we hired a bodyguard for Gloria? Mark added, the concern evident in his voice. Let's hold off on that for now, Stott replied, shaking his head. What's puzzling is, if Marshall was behind the break-in at our house, why do it? When Gloria was away, you must have known she was in Portland. Yeah, you're right. That doesn't add up. But in this line of work, I've learned that most of these people act irrationally. Maybe the break-in and the stalking are unrelated. We'll keep them connected for now until we find out more, Mark assured him. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate you getting on this so quickly and your personal attention to our concerns. What else would you expect? You're not just a client. You and Gloria have been friends for years, Mark said, his voice warm with sincerity. With that, Scott and Mark stood up, shaking hands firmly. Scott left Mark's office, the weight of the unresolved mystery heavy on his shoulders as he headed down the street to his own office. Every step a reminder of the urgency and danger that loomed over them. Scott found himself hyper aware of his surroundings, his eyes darting to every reflection in shop windows as he walked. The city felt different now, more menacing. Mark watched his friend leave, a grave look settling over his face. Without hesitation, he picked up the phone. Annis, could you please ask Aaron to come see me? Thanks. Meanwhile, Walter Marshall's frustration grew with each passing moment. On Tuesday morning, he was summoned to the HR department, where he was met with the chilling news of a serious complaint of harassment lodged against him. He knew it had to be Dorothy McCorklin, jealous of his proximity to Gloria. He swore to make her pay for it. But Walter's more immediate concern was Scott Palmer. It had been almost a week since his botched attempt to break into the Palmer house, and he was still without a solid plan. Returning to the house was too risky, especially with the new ADT sign glaring at him. Every idea he considered for getting rid of Scott carried a heavy weight of potential capture. What good was eliminating Scott if it meant ending up in prison? Unable to marry Gloria, the thought of jail sent shivers down his spine, reminding him of the trouble he narrowly escaped in high school. An insidious idea began to take shape in Walter's mind. Instead of killing Scott, why not frame him for a crime so heinous that Gloria would have no choice but to leave him? The crime had to be something so vile, it would ensure Scott's long stay behind bars. But what crime could shatter their lives so completely? As Walter brooded over his dilemma at his cubicle, he caught a glimpse of Gloria's reflection in his monitor. Suddenly, an unsettling clarity washed over Walter. If he orchestrated the death of the Palmer's daughter and framed Scott for it, Gloria would have no choice but to divorce him. The thought of Scott's child suffering, the child who had always looked at him with that infuriating smirk, filled Walter with a twisted sense of satisfaction. This was it. This was his solution. But it needed careful planning. With this horrifying plan in mind, Walter logged onto the online dating service Dorothy had mentioned. Within 35 minutes, he had found her profile, and under the alias Marvin Woods, 
he sent Dorothy McLaughlin a request to meet. He leaned back in his chair, a smug grin spreading across his face, finally feeling in control. His mind raced with possibilities, the gears of his dark scheme turning with a sickening clarity. Dorothy spent the first half of the week auditing the Eugene office. It wasn't until Thursday afternoon that she and Gloria had a chance to catch up. Gloria couldn't help but scan the cafe before speaking, the paranoia from the park incident still fresh in her mind. She recounted the terrifying moments at the park and the hollow response from HR. Dorothy, though shocked by the park incident, wasn't surprised by HR's lack of action. Most HR guys are spineless, she remarked with a sigh. Gloria realized she was monopolizing the conversation and quickly pivoted, asking Dorothy about her date last weekend. Dorothy sighed. Another online date, another let down. He was nice, but by the end of the evening, we both knew it wasn't going anywhere. Hearing Dorothy's story made Gloria's heart ache. Dorothy's first marriage had crumbled after she caught her husband cheating twice. They had tried counseling, but he had been caught with his secretary again. She had blown the whistle, hoping to win him back. Good luck, sweetheart. Dorothy's tone turned lighter. Since Tuesday evening, I've been talking to a seemingly decent guy. We're planning to meet soon. He's finishing a project at work first, so maybe within the next week or so. Gloria forced a smile. That's great. One day the right guy will make you happy. You deserve it. As she sat there, Gloria silently thanked her lucky stars. She wasn't in Dorothy's shoes. Despite the tension, the week passed relatively calmly at the Palmer residence. Thanks to Mark Morris's connections, the security system was installed and operational, casting a reassuring sense of security over the home. Christina was coming home on Friday, a final exam for the summer quarter behind her. Gloria and Scott were bubbling with excitement, counting down the hours until they could finally wrap their arms around their daughter. They had cleared their schedules for the next two weeks, planning a special retreat at their cabin on Lake Wachee in eastern Washington. The days were to be filled with hiking trails and lazy afternoons spent fishing, a brief escape from the world. The second week promised a new dynamic with Christina's boyfriend joining them. Gloria hoped their relationship wasn't too serious, considering Christina's young age of 20. Scott, on the other hand, was eager to have a heart-to-heart -heart with him. Scott's protectiveness over Christina was well known, but Christina understood that their concern was rooted in love and she always took it in stride with a knowing smile. On Friday evening, Scott stopped by Mark Morris's office on his way home. Aaron was waiting, ready to brief him on what they had uncovered. Walter's real name was Walter Rolf Marshall, a 29-year-old from Richmond, Washington. His last known job was with Exxon in Houston. Mark had tried to dig into why he left Exxon, but the information was as elusive as a ghost. No arrest records or convictions surface in Texas or anywhere else. But then Aaron leaned in, his tone turning serious. Here's where it gets tricky. We suspect he has a juvenile record. He attended public high school in Richmond for his freshman and sophomore years, but he's missing from the yearbook for the following year. We checked local private schools, but found no record of him attending. His parents stayed in the same house, but Walter wasn't enrolled anywhere nearby. Aaron continued, showing Scott a couple of yearbook photos and a local phone directory. We tracked down a few of his former classmates. None of them claimed to be his friends, but two remembered rumors about Walter taking up skirt photos. There were even whispers about a hole in the girl's locker room. Scott felt a shiver run down his spine. Walter seemed to vanish from the radar until he was 20 and in college. If he had a juvenile record, a good attorney would have had it erased unless it involved a conviction as an offender. Since we didn't find any, it's safe to assume he wasn't involved in any offenses. Scott exhaled, the breath he didn't realize he was holding finally escaping his lungs. Well, I suppose that's somewhat reassuring, but what's our next move? He asked, his voice tight with concern. We'll address that shortly, but there are two more things you need to know. Mark said, his voice grave. First, Marshall owns a drone, a high-end model equipped with a quality camera. A neighbor from across the street has seen him on the roof with it. 
Once it takes off, he disappears, likely retreating to his apartment to control it remotely, watching through the camera. He only returns to the roof when the drone lands. Scott's brow furrowed. Is that even legal? The legality of drones is a grey area right now. Neither the state legislature nor the feds have kept pace with the rapid advancement of drone technology. As usual, the feds were caught off guard. All right, you mentioned two things. What's the other? Mark took a deep breath. A second piece of information is more concerning. Marshall owns a 9mm Glock. Are you familiar with Magnum? Scott's eyes darkened. I know enough to recognize it. I couldn't tell what I saw the night of the break-in. It was too dark and far away. Does Marshall have a permit for it? No, but most criminals don't bother with a concealed carry permit. Have you thought about carrying? That's not going to happen. Gloria is terrified of Magnums. She won't even allow mine in the house. Mark nodded, understanding. I wouldn't recommend anyone carry if they're not comfortable with firearms. Too many things can go wrong if you're not trained and prepared. I know you got Gloria a handheld mace canister. You might want to get one for yourself and Christina too. Scott swallowed hard, the weight of the situation pressing down on him. What about your suggestion? What's the plan? Regarding your earlier question, it might be costly, but I propose hiring a law firm in Texas to access Exxon's records. It could cost us a few thousand or more if Exxon decides to resist, but with the right legal team, we can secure a judge's order to release their personnel files on Marshall. If we get that order, it can shield us from any potential countersuit from Marshall. Scott didn't hesitate. Let's do it. Mark, Aaron, and Scott spent another 25 minutes delving into the specifics of the investigation, each detail more urgent than the last. The room was thick with tension, the stakes higher than ever. Mark had mentioned the option of hiring a bodyguard, given that Aaron would be in Texas. He wasn't available, but Mark had other alternatives. Though Scott still felt it was overkill, he decided to stop by the outdoor store on his way home, grabbing two canisters of pepper spray. As Scott pulled into the driveway, a warm smile spread across his face at the sight of Christina's car. Having her home for the next 2.5 weeks filled him with a sense of joy he hadn't felt in a long time. Walking through the door, Christina greeted him with a tight hug, but he couldn't ignore the serious look in her eyes. When were you going to tell me about the break-in? Her voice cracked with emotion, tears glistening in her eyes. If anything happened to you or mom, I don't know how I cope. Promise me you'll keep yourself safe. Promise. Scott saw Gloria standing just behind Christina, her eyes also filled with unshed tears. He realized how much he had taken for granted the presence of these two amazing women in his life. How had he been so lucky? The thought of navigating the next few weeks with them both so emotional weighed heavily on him, but a deep sense of gratitude washed over him. He hugged Christina tightly, whispering his promise to do everything in his power to keep them safe. The evening buzzed with conversation, filled with laughter and stories. Gloria, barely pausing to eat, regaled them with tales from her semester, especially gushing about the amazing young man she was dating, Brian Nichols. He was a senior in engineering at RIT and soon to join the army as a second lieutenant. Scott listened, feeling a mixture of pride and apprehension, already bracing himself for the inevitable meeting with the young man he might soon call his future son-in-law. When Christina asked about the break-in, Scott's heart sank. This was the moment he had dreaded since meeting with the detectives. He didn't want to frighten Gloria or Christina, yet he couldn't allow them to underestimate the danger. He took a deep breath and began to recount the details of the break-in, including how he had confronted the intruder with the magnum. Christina glanced at her mom, knowing her aversion to firearms, but couldn't help but laugh at Scott's dramatic shouts down the stairs. Come on up, got a little surprise for you, Dad. Christina's laugh cut through the tension, her eyes sparkling with amusement. Is that something from one of your Bruce Willis movies? She teased. I don't know, hon, just felt right at the time. Scott replied with a shrug. Anyway, it worked. Three seconds later, I heard the screen door slam. The room fell into a brief, heavy silence, the gravity of the evening's events setting in. 
Gloria finally broke the silence, her voice steady. Let's clear the plates, and I'll load the dishwasher. You too can have some one-on-one -on -one time. Christina and Scott exchanged glances, appreciating the quiet moment to talk without worrying about Gloria overhearing. As they stepped outside for a walk around the block, Scott spoke first, his voice low. Listen, I didn't want to scare your mom too much, but this Marshall guy might be more dangerous than I let on. One of the detectives is checking out his old home and workplace next week. Hopefully, we'll learn more about this creep before your mom goes back to work in three weeks. I've convinced her to carry Mace when she's alone in the parking garage. I got one for you too. I hope you'll consider carrying it just in case. Christina's face softened as she took a deep breath, her voice barely above a whisper. Dad, I hope you won't think badly of Brian, but he's taught me how to use a magnum. I have a concealed carry permit and a 9mm semi-auto. I go to the range with Brian, and I'm pretty good. You can keep the mace, I'll keep my Smith and Wesson. Scott was momentarily stunned, his mind racing. So where is it now? I can't imagine what your mom would say if she knew there was a gun in the house or the cabin. It's in my bedroom, with a trigger lock for safety while I'm not around. The key's in my pocket. Christina's words hum in the air, a mixture of defiance and resolve. Scott took a moment to gather his thoughts, then spoke with a softer tone. I don't like keeping secrets from your mom, but let me figure out how to talk to her about having it in the house. Let's keep this between us for now. The more Walter obsessed over the idea of ending Christina Palmer's life, the more his resolve wavered. He couldn't deny the complexity of framing Scott. Making it foolproof was nearly impossible. Plus, if Scott stayed alive, neither he nor Gloria would benefit from Scott's life insurance, and Scott might train all their savings on legal battles. Walter had been counting on that money to start a new life. He detested work, and the thought of having enough funds to relax and enjoy life was his dream. Killing Norma and framing Scott was out of the question. He had to simplify. His new plan was straightforward. Approach Scott on the street one night, make it look like a botched mugging, and take him out. There was no link between Walter and Scott, so why would the police ever suspect him? Walter was confident, almost too clever for his own good. To ensure the murder looked like a robbery, Walter took to the streets on Saturday night, tagging buildings with gang graffiti. As he watched the local news on Sunday, he felt a surge of satisfaction. A reporter spoke of rising gang activity, and Walter smirked, relieved by the slow news day. It was Tuesday evening when Dorothy McCorpin left the lounge, her steps unsteady from the alcohol. The day had been rough, and her date with Marvin Woods from the online site had been a disaster. Dorothy's spirits had plummeted, and two Cosmos had hit her harder than she'd expected. Stumbling to her car, she fumbled with her keys, barely noticing the sweet smell of a rag pressed against her face before darkness took over. When Dorothy came to, she was disoriented, her arms and legs bound, a shoulder strap cutting into her. The dim light revealed Walter Marshall's cold eyes peering at her from between the front seats. Fear surged through her as she struggled against her restraints. Walter, what are you doing? Let me go. Her voice trembled, a mixture of panic and confusion. Dorothy's voice wavered, her fear growing with every word. Dorothy, why did you complain about me at work? Marshall's voice was cold, tense. I didn't. I never complained about you. Dorothy's confusion deepened. Why are you saying that? Don't lie to me, witch. I know it was you who told HR I was offending you. Walter's tone was menacing, his eyes burning with anger. I didn't. It was Gloria who complained when you wouldn't stop stalking her. Dorothy blurted out, the words sipping from her lips before she could stop them. You're lying. Doria loves me. We're getting married once Scott's out of the picture. Dorothy's words hung in the air, a mix of confusion and disbelief. Walter's face twisted in shock. Gloria loves you. What? I didn't know that. His voice faltered, the realization hitting him like a freight train. Please, just let me go. I promise not to tell anyone about this. I didn't report you to HR, Dorothy pleaded, 
her voice trembling with desperation. Alta stepped out of the car, leaving Dorothy in the cold, deserted parking lot. He needed time to collect his thoughts. Fifteen minutes later, he returned, the dome light flickering off, plunging them back into darkness. Okay, I'll release you, but you have to answer my questions and keep your word about not spilling tonight's secrets, understand? Walter's voice was cold, almost detached. Dorothy nodded, her fear palpable, desperate for any chance to save her life. Walter originally wanted Dorothy to suffer, but now, as he looked at her terrified face, pity crept in. She was just caught up in this mess. Still, she had to go, but he decided to knock her out first, needing the information he sought. Walter stepped out of the car, grabbing a bottle of chloroform and soaking a rag. Dorothy's eyes widened as she recognized the smell. Please, she begged, her voice a desperate whisper, but Walter ignored her pleas. He waited until she went limp, her body collapsing into unconsciousness. Sorry, Dorothy, he muttered, wrapping the rag tightly around her neck with tape. He waited outside for 15 minutes, the night air thick with the scent of his grim task. Walter hoisted Dorothy's lifeless body, carrying her up the trail to the cliff, hoping the wildlife would erase any trace of him. Then he planned to flee the country, leaving behind a trail of vengeance against Gloria and her family. A twisted smile crossed his face as he drove Dorothy's car to the address she had given him. A cabin, the perfect hideout. Even better than his original plan, Walter thought, the darkness of his intentions wrapping around him like a shroud. Meanwhile, Aaron Larson had to wait until Tuesday to reach Houston, delayed by a court appearance. The first law firm in Houston, recommended by the Tacoma attorneys, declined the case citing a conflict. Aaron felt a heavy sense of disappointment, wondering if the Tacoma lawyers knew this before he flew down. Just when he thought the situation couldn't get more frustrating, a stroke of luck led him to Hensley and Briggs, where George Hensley agreed to assist with the Exxon meetings. Two hours later, Aaron sat across from Hampton's assistant, Arlene Patrick, at a quiet table in a secluded corner of a dimly lit cafe. The air was thick with tension and unspoken questions. I know your lawyer is working on getting a subpoena, but there are crucial things about Walter Marshall that aren't in the file. Aaron began, his voice low and urgent. Arlene looked around, ensuring no one was listening. Aren't you worried about getting in trouble for meeting with me? No, Aaron replied firmly. Mr. Hampton actually wanted me to meet with you. He's a good guy, legally limited, but he's determined to help you protect that woman up north. When we let go of Marshall, Mr. Hampton was concerned we were just delaying the problem. When the Tacoma firm called for a reference, he tried to warn them without breaking any rules, but they didn't catch on. Arlene leaned in, her eyes wide with concern. What's in the file? What's in the file are records of two warnings Marshall got for harassing women in his department. One woman even complained he was touching himself inappropriately during a meeting. Hampton was about to fire Marshall when he suddenly quit with barely any notice. A week later, we got a call from the Houston police, following up on a request from Mexican authorities. They were investigating a woman's death in the desert and wanted to talk to Marshall. He left Texas abruptly. Aaron's voice was heavy with the weight of the revelations. Grindley contacted the police when he got the call from Tacoma, but we haven't heard from them since until your office called us last week. Arlene's face turned pale. Do you know what happened with the woman's death in the Mexican police inquiry? That's the concerning part, Aaron continued, lowering his voice even more. Grinley asked me unofficially to check because my brother-in-law is a cop. Here's what I found. The woman was from Mexico, but had a work visa in Texas. It seems she met Walter Marshall on a dating site, and her friends believe they dated briefly before she ended it. They were baffled by her body being found in Mexico. As she rarely crossed the border, only visiting family on Sundays and always returning before dark. The Mexican police wanted to speak with Marshall because records showed he entered the country shortly before the woman's body was discovered by a farmer. Her entry into Mexico wasn't recorded. Though there wasn't enough evidence to bring Marshall back, they asked the Houston PD to question him. They tried once, 
just before Marshall quit. When they attempted to reach him again, he had vanished. We shared what we knew, but that was the last we heard. Given the situation with drug gangs in Mexico, it wasn't a top priority for them. However, my brother-in-law mentioned there's a warrant if Marshall ever goes back. Aaron and Miss Patrick finished their lunch. She provided more details before they went their separate ways. Aaron called his boss in Tacoma, who then tried to reach Scott, but only got his voicemail. On Thursday, Walter drove past the Palmer cabin, contemplating life's unfairness and wondering when luck would finally be on his side. Noticing one of the cars missing from the night before, he figured either Gloria or Christina wasn't home, though he yearned to act. The previous night, the motion lights flickering on as he approached the cabin changed his plans. Scott Palmer was mowing the lawn as Walter passed by, using Google Earth to navigate. Walter had an idea of nearby cabins, and seeing no neighbors around, confirmed it posed no threat. Parking at the state park, he grabbed his mountain bike to blend in better and attract less attention. Walter reflected on how it had become easier the first time. He felt sick afterward, but with each subsequent victim, it troubled him less. The Mexican woman in particular angered him for abruptly ending their date. He disposed of her body in Mexico and fled town after a visit from the Houston police. Now, as he approached the Palmer cabin, any hesitation from previous killings was gone. He was consumed by a chilling sense of determination. I'm going to enjoy this, he muttered to himself, his eyes cold and resolute. Scott thought he heard a scream, faintly slicing through the roar of the mower. He froze, his eyes wide, catching a glimpse of two shadowy figures through the cabin window. Adrenaline surged through him as he killed the engine, sprinting across the lawn, every muscle tense for what lay ahead. Christina pulled up to the cabin, her senses on high alert. The mower left out in the open was unsettling, a rare sight that set her instincts ablaze, her mother's Ahsoka warnings echoing in her mind. She wondered how he could have found them, her heart pounding with dread. She noticed the door was ajar, a break in the usual routine that had her pulse racing. Torn between a mundane explanation, perhaps her parents needed some privacy, and a gnawing feeling of impending danger, she slipped the pistol Brian had taught her to handle safely into her pocket, its weight grounding her resolve. She pushed the door open, her steps silent, but her mind screaming with the urgency of her mother's safety. Inside, the chilling scene hit her like a brick wall. Her parents, held at gunpoint by a monstrous stranger. The words hit Christina like a punch to the gut. Come on, I said join the party. Your mother's been leading me on, making me think she liked me. But she was just laughing at me with Dorothy and Corklin. Dorothy isn't laughing anymore, and soon neither will your mother. Come on in. Christina stood frozen, her mind racing, Brian's lessons flashing through her memory. She remembered his calm, steady voice, teaching her to aim, to shoot with precision. She had a clear shot at Marshall, the pistol's grip cold in her hand, but the moment was nothing like the movies. Brian had warned her, the hostage gets shot first. Marshall, misreading her fear, sneered. Scared, huh? Frozen in fear. This will be even more fun than I thought. I was going to let your mom watch me off you and your dad, then have some fun with her before ending it. But now that I see how cute you are, I might play with you first. Your dad isn't so brave. Without his tool, he taunted, his voice dripping with malice. I've got a little something for you here. His laughter echoed through the room, a sound so cold it sent shivers down Christina's spine. Marshall turned his gaze back to Christina, a sadistic grin spreading across his face. And just because I can, I'll let your mom and dad watch as I put bullets in their knees, keep them alive but unable to move, he said, his voice dripping with cruel amusement. Rising from the stool, he positioned himself near the sofa, aiming for Scott's knees first, seeing him as the bigger threat. But in his haste, he couldn't keep an eye on Christina and her parents simultaneously. Christina saw her moment, dropping the bag, she gripped the pistol tightly, her hands steady with the weight of her resolve. The thud of the bag hitting the floor caught Marshall's attention for just a split second. It was enough. 
In that moment, her eyes locked onto the sight of the shield semi-auto. Marshall's eyes widened in shock as he realized the danger too late. He fumbled, trying to swing his Glock towards Christina, but his movements were sluggish, hampered by his overconfidence. Christina didn't hesitate. She pulled the trigger, not burdened by the weight of taking a life, but driven by the countless hours of practice. She prayed silently that this was the only way to save her family. The first bullet struck Marshall squarely in the chest. Before he could even process the impact, the sound of the second shot rang out. Remembering Brian's lessons, Christina fired twice more in rapid succession, her aim true and unyielding. In less than two seconds, Marshall crumpled to the floor, lifeless. Scott, with a surge of adrenaline, kicked the magnum away, though Marshall was already down. It was a reflex, a surge of action born out of sheer terror and the primal need to protect. Scott hadn't frozen in fear. He had been ready to act, questioning his bravery and his masculinity. He wondered if confronting Marshall sooner, with the magnum ready, might have made a difference. Did his hesitation, waiting for Christina, somehow delay his action? As he replayed the harrowing scenario in his mind, Scott wondered if he should have anticipated Christina's arrival with the Magnum. Would he have acted sooner, risking everything to shield his daughters from harm? Deep down, he knew the truth. Just moments before Christina dropped the bag, he was on the verge of lunging at Marshall, a desperate attempt to disarm him, despite the slim odds of success. Fate had intervened, the bag falling just before he made his move. For now, Scott was overwhelmed with relief, knowing his daughter was safe, and the nightmare was over. Scott pulled Gloria into a tight embrace, then gestured for Christina to join them. Christina, careful to clear the round from her pistol before stepping into the circle, felt the weight of the moment. Gloria, seeing what Christina had done, could only stare, the shock still lingering in her eyes. The intensity of the ordeal was beginning to recede, replaced by the tender glow of relief. Where did you get that thing? Doria asked, her voice trembling slightly. Scott and Christina exchanged nervous glances before Scott spoke up, his voice steady but filled with an unspoken gratitude. We'll talk about it later, honey. Just be grateful that our daughter knows how to use it. The sound of sirens soon filled the air as state troopers and county sheriffs arrived within 25 minutes of the Palmer's 911 call. The scene seemed straightforward. Christina had acted in self-defense. Another 25 minutes passed before Marshall's car was found, its contents unraveling a web of horror. It wasn't just the ties to the events of the tires that shocked everyone, but the chilling connections to two unsolved murders in Miami and Mexico. Two more days would pass before Dorothy's body was discovered and Marshall's grim collection of mementos from all three victims was revealed. Alongside them, hundreds of photos of unsuspecting women, found on thumb drives locked inside a suitcase, spanned the last 13 years, each image a silent testament to Marshall's twisted desires. In the following days, Scott found solace on the back porch, a beer in hand, watching the moon rise over the lake. The sky, dark enough to reveal countless stars, was suddenly pierced by a shooting star streaking across the Milky Way. Scott thought back to the child of tradition of making wishes on falling stars, but tonight he had no need to wish. His wish had already been granted. He turned his gaze back to the cabin, where Gloria, Christina and Brian sat around the table, the flickering candlelight casting a warm glow. Brian had arrived earlier that day, and Scott found himself inexplicably drawn to the young man. Brian was intelligent, respectful, and clearly smitten with Christina. Throughout the evening, Scott's usually stern demeanor softened, his protective instincts melting away. Gloria watched with amusement, noting the stark contrast between Scott's treatment of Brian and his previous encounters with Christina's past dates. Scott had even agreed to Brian's offer to teach him proper magnum handling at the local range, though Gloria politely declined the same training. For now, she had reluctantly agreed to allow a firearm in their home, but with no intention of ever using it herself. She mused that perhaps her perspective might evolve over time, but for the moment, she considered it a small victory, recognizing that banning magnums would only empower criminals. Sitting on the back porch, Scott finished his beer, 
feeling an overwhelming sense of gratitude. Gloria soon appeared, carrying two long neck bottles. She handed one to Scott before taking a swig herself. This makes four beers for me tonight, Scott said, chuckling. I'll probably have to get up at least once during the night because of it. Gloria grinned and replied, If you come back to bed, don't hesitate to wake me up. She paused, looking at Scott with a playful glint in her eyes. When was the last time we stayed up late together? Scott's grin widened, but before he could answer, the screen door creaked open again. Brian and Pristina stepped out, heading towards the lake. We're going out in the rowboat and might go for a swim, Pristina announced. Scott and Doria chimed in simultaneously. Be careful out there. Gloria looked at Scott with a knowing smile. I like him, and I can see you do too. Having him here is good. It'll help distract Pristina from what happened last week. Scott nodded, his expression softening. Walter Marshall deserved to die. A bit's unfortunate our daughter had to do it. She had a couple of rough nights last weekend. Just now, we were in the kitchen, and Pristina was opening up about her feelings. Brian comforted her, letting her have a good cry. That young man shows a level of maturity beyond his years. How did we get so fortunate, Scott? I can't stop thinking about Dorothy and how tragic her life was. She was such a kind woman, and her ending was so heartbreaking. It brings tears to my eyes just thinking about it. Doria continued, her voice breaking with emotion. She paused, the weight of the memory heavy on her heart. Scott wrapped his arm around Doria, pulling her clothes. He offered silent comfort, his embrace a warm shield against the sadness that threatens to overwhelm them. Together, they sat in the quiet, the distant sounds of the lake a soothing balm to their troubled souls. Thank you all for lending an ear to my story. Feel free to share your thoughts and explore the other videos. Your support means more than you know.